started. We're going to do chapter 22 today, or at least as much as we can of it. Chapter 22 is talking about water, how water affects us. And as I am sure is clear to everyone, water makes a really big difference in our lives. Oh, I forgot one more thing um, besides where Brittany is on. There's Brittany. It's the gymnastics team's home show tomorrow night on April Fool's Day, right? Candace and Vanessa? Yeah. yeah. So I am going to try. Yes, and Brandon. <laughs> I'm going to try to make it out Saturday night, which, you know, I hardly even get out of the house on weekends, but to support my students, you know, see them do their thing. So you should too. They're your classmates and your friends, except for people who wear Patriots hats. They're not your friends. All right. So getting started, let's start with the clicker question. Where are you not likely to find a volcano? Oh, I know. Oh, he, obviously. <laughs> um, Maggie and Brittany and Raquel. Okay. Okay, everyone has answered and everyone got it right. Yes. I, I am pleased with that. That might indicate we learned something in lab yesterday, right? I'm going to take it as that. So let's let's check what we learned. We're going to call four people here. Yes, Haley. Haley. What is what is a a convergent a? What is a convergent boundary? That's the question. Wasn't that one of the ones that was on the edges? Well, they're all boundaries. They're all on edges. Well, I well, actually, except for hot spot. Was in the middle. Yeah. Somewhere. All but all the boundaries are on edges. Question. What does convergent mean? Doesn't one of them come together before they come together? The subduction. Yeah, the subduction. Okay. Subduction, subduction occurs at convergent boundaries. Yeah. Convergent yeah. boundaries are where they come together, which is what Hannah was saying. They come together and something's got to give. That's the result. Well, what results in convergent boundaries? Moving when they move towards each other. You get what? Okay, volcanoes. You get volcanoes because of the grinding, melting rock that then floats up and make volca makes volcanoes. There's another thing that happens because of convergent boundaries. What's that? Mountains, mountain building. Um, yes, earthquakes are also associated with them. I wasn't thinking that, but that's also true. So like the understanding right now is that the Rocky Mountains in Colorado are the result of the convergent boundary between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. It is not only subducting and causing volcanoes, or not now, it was in the past. Right now it's a transform. Oops. <clears throat> That's the question for the next person. Uh, but it, it was at one time a convergent boundary, grinding underneath, making volcanoes, and building up the mountains. You know, the whole plate out there was going until it folded up in Colorado. So you can blame California for the Rocky Mountains if you like. Okay. Next person. Casey. Me. Tell us what a transform boundary is. Somewhere you would not likely find a volcano. Why? What is it? Two questions there. Um, truthfully, I just recognize all the other words, but that one. Yeah. Because it's really hard to say. Yeah. Because it's really hard to say. Yeah. So I gave you the hardest one for you. Yeah. Okay. Well, I used hand signs just a moment ago to indicate what a transform boundary is. 
Transform boundaries are shown like this because you have the two surfaces sliding against each other. Because they're sliding against each other, you don't have the grinding down deep melting rock to float up. So that's why it doesn't make volcanoes. Um, just for consistency, the convergent boundary, it's going like this. So finally, for the boundaries, Eric, what is a divergent boundary? Exactly. So the divergent, and of course we have the words, converge, diverge. They're not like hidden secret meanings. They're pretty obvious. Convergent, come together. Divergent, move apart. And finally, one of these things is not like the other. Vanessa. Huh? Hot spot. Um, islands. Right. Um, the hot spots make the Hawaiian islands. But the I, I know of only two hot spots, the Hawaiian Islands and um, Yellowstone. Yellowstone's not an island. What is a hot spot? Um, it's where magma and explodes. Okay, where's the magma? The water. Where's the magma coming from? Underground. Okay, not just underground. It's magma from lower in the mantle. And it basically melts its way up because it's hot. Hot things are less dense. It floats up, melts the rock above until it comes through, comes through the crust, and you have magma that floats. So the Hawaiian Islands, this is what we learned in lab yesterday, the Hawaiian Islands are the result of one hot spot, one place where you have a magma chamber down in the mantle the surface of the earth moves above like your dryer sheet was moving above and the magma punches up and makes new islands. So the newest island it said was uh, Mauna Loa, right? Hmm? <laughs> Pretty sure it was Mauna Loa. What was it called? Mauna Loa. M-A-U-N-A. L-O-A. I was like Moana Loa. And so you still have volcanoes there. You have, what is it, Volcano National Park there? Those volcanoes have lava that just flows nice and easily. So you don't have crazy eruptions. You have other kinds of magma, such as what has been produced in the past at Yellowstone, that comes out with great force and makes great eruptions. It depends on how fluid the magma is, which kind you get. If it flows easily, you form the shield volcanoes like the Hawaiian Islands. Otherwise, you can form the cinder, and we talked about those. Okay, now let's talk about water. That was just to make sure we learned something and we all nailed it. Well, you all nailed it. Sounds good. First, surprising statistics. More than 97% of all of the Earth's water is in the oceans. So we're dealing with only about 3% of the total water on Earth when we talk about the water that we normally deal with. Now in California, of course, we have the oceans and we talk about the ocean water. And of that water, you see the vast, vast majority of it is in ice caps and glaciers of the remaining pure water, what we could drink. So it says here only 1%. Well, if you, <laughs> that's not 1%, right? That's more like point, <laughs> 0.6263%, less than 1% of all of the Earth's water is water that we use for drinking and for watering our crops and so on. Kind of interesting, isn't it? <coughs> what was that? Yeah, less than 1%. So now is water important to us? Obviously, I'm going to take that as a rhetorical question. Yes, water is very important to us. <clears throat> so let's talk about it a little. Come back. We have the hydrologic cycle. That's the cycle of how water moves. While over 97% of the water is saline water in the ocean, water that we can't drink or use to water our crops, 
the hydrologic cycle is the cycle water goes through. So water that is on the surface of the earth will evaporate into the sky. And then once the water is evaporated into the sky, in a matter of 10 to 14 days, it usually falls back down to the earth. So the water in the ocean, depending on where you are, it's like deep ocean water spends thousands of years there. It's pretty much out of circulation. Lakes, more like 100 years. Um, streams is measured in a couple of weeks. And time it spends in the air is a couple of weeks. But here's the cycle of water moving from one place to another. So we have salty water in the oceans, right? When it evaporates, is that salty water that evaporates into the air? <coughs> for the most part, no. Now, those of you who've been there for the morning fog at Monterey Bay Academy, it definitely has a little bit of salt to tang in it. It's not perfectly pure. But it's mostly pure water. So, Brandon, since you answered no correctly, why? Um, I thought that like, the salt or other impurities like, stay on the ground with the water and salt is Because they're their boiling point where they become vapor is a much higher temperature. And so it's a natural purification process. We call it distillation. Now, of course, when I was a kid, MASH was on TV, and they built a still in, in their tent, swampy as they call it, um, on, <clears throat> on MASH. And I was like, you know, what is this magical device? I didn't know what it was. <laughs> what it, the still is, is it something that heats up a mixture of alcohol and water? You know, they've, they've done something to ferment. That's the first step. And then they heat it up. Which boils at a lower temperature, ethanol or water? Ethanol. ethanol does. And so what happens is they heat it up hot enough for ethanol to evaporate, but the water doesn't. And so then they have ethanol that goes up in vapor, and then they have cooling coils where it condenses and they collect what condensed. And that's a very high percentage of alcohol. That's what the whole idea of the still is. You take the stuff you fermented and you separate out the alcohol. And of course, you and I, as good non-imbibing adults, would not drink the stuff we distill. We would say we purified it by boiling off the alcohol. So if you, you know, buy something like one of those near beers, you know, something that's a non-alcoholic beer, all they've done is heated it up so that the alcohol will go out in vapor, which they probably collected to put in another one of their alcoholic drinks, but you're left with a depleted alcohol um, beer in that case. So it's the same idea of how it separates the salt water from the pure water. So the precipitation should be pretty pure water. Um, why do I have this picture on two successive slides? I don't remember. Um, I think I actually intended to delete this first one and only have one because I remember copying it from one to the other. Um, the two things that are affecting the hydrologic cycle, the things that make it work, gravity makes things fall. Heat is what causes us to have the evaporation and things expand and float up. So those are the two primary forces driving. I know heat is not a force, but they're the driving things for the hydrologic cycle. The processes are evaporation, precipitation. Everybody knows the word precipitation, right? It's a common term for it. Rain, right. So rain, infiltration. <laughs> infiltration means stuff flowing in. And then runoff, flowing out. Um, so <clears throat> what things will affect groundwater? Groundwater is really important to us. Groundwater is the water that we pump up out of wells to drink. And groundwater, the ground can store water if you have a porous soil. Porous means it has pores. That is, you have little gaps. So if I have something made out of, let's say, spheres, those spheres fit like this. And you have gaps here. 
and that's where water can be stored. So the porosity is measuring, and we actually have a ratio here, the open space divided by the total volume. So my little blue there was to represent the open space. So something that has a high porosity has a lot of open space for the same amount of volume. Low porosity, less. So something that is porous can hold water. The greater the porosity, the more water you can store in it. So we will have soil that is completely saturated. It's filled with water in those pores. And we could put a well, dig down into that, and pump the water out. The porosity, of course, depends on particle sizes. If I were to pack, um, let's say, BBs and pack basketballs, <laughs> you actually would have the same ratio of the two. But if I pack BBs and basketballs together, the BBs would fill in gaps from the basketballs, and that would decrease my porosity. So the size and the shape of particles makes a difference to the porosity. So that's the first thing that affects groundwater, porosity, how much water it can hold. A second thing is permeability. Permeability is a measurement of how easily water can go through the material. Imagine that you have bubble wrap. That bubble wrap has a very high porosity because you have all of those bubbles sealed in. But its permeability is zero because no water could get into those bubbles. And so that would not store water well because it can't get the water in. Even though it has places it could store it, you can't get it in there. So permeability is another big piece of the puzzle. You have to have more than just porous soil. It has to also be permeable so water can get in to those pores. And so the way that the sediment is packed, how hard it's packed, the type of material, all those will play into the permeability. So here's an example of a soil that has high porosity, low permeability. If you have clay, in the soil under your house, <coughs> that clay can hold a lot of water, but it's pretty much waterproof. So when you have a big rain, what happens under your house? Your basement floods because you basically have a swimming pool. The clay is non-porous, water comes in from the rain, and it flows down through the top soil, gets to that clay, and it stops. And it builds up, and then your basement has water at a higher pressure than air inside, and water flows into your basement. We've spent over $10,000 trying to take care of that at our home to keep water from coming up from the basement because of that clay soil out there. There's another thing about that clay soil. It is very porous. So over time, you can get water in there, and it soaks it up, and it expands. What happens when that clay expands under my house? Yeah, things go, uh, uh, uh. so you hear creaks and we have cracks in the walls because of the soil. When it is wet season, it collects more water and it rises. When it's dry, it loses water and drops. So these things you know, have a direct effect on our homes as well as our water. Groundwater is the term that's referred to where we have saturated soil. Saturated means it's holding all of the water it could possibly hold. So if you go down, if you start drilling down, almost anywhere on earth, if you drill down, eventually you're going to hit a place where the soil is saturated. And so once you get to that saturated zone, then you say, we've hit the groundwater. Now, if that groundwater is you know, at ground level, it's not a good place to build your home, right? You don't want to be at ground level. You want to be below your basement for sure. Um, also below your swimming pool. There are places where you have swimming pools and if you drain the swimming pool, it floats up out of the ground because the water table is higher than the bottom of the swimming pool. That's not really the preferred thing to happen. 
Um, above the saturated zone, they measure the soil mo moisture, which is, you know, the ratio of how much water to how much you could hold. And the water table is the name for the boundary between the non-saturated and saturated soils. So here is a diagram that helps us understand this. So we have down here the water table. Notice it has two lines. The dashed line is during drought conditions. The conditions that California was under until this past fall and winter. Drought, the water table drops. So we have a small, small farm, 40 acres of almond trees or almond trees for those who don't grow up. And we were really worried because a lot of growers who have wells, their wells dried up. And if the wells dry up, what that means is the water table drops below the bottom of your well. So in this picture here, in the drought season, that well is going to be pulling nothing. And that happened to a lot of people in the Central Valley last summer. Unfortunately, we are right next to the, uh, the, the Modesto Reservoir and the boundary between our property and my uncle's property is the canal, which the canals are very porous and made out of concrete and it freely flows from that concrete into the ground, replenishing it. So we did not have this problem. Notice the table moves up and down. It's not always level. And the stream, of course, the water level in the stream is gonna match the water table at the edges there Otherwise, you just have water flowing from the stream into the ground. The stream level will drop over time. Or the water table rises to reach um, equilibrium there. Aquifers are reservoirs of groundwater, places that you have a lot of water. I talked in class, what was it, yesterday, the day before, about the Ogallala Aquifer, a huge underground lake, if you will. Now, when I say underground lake, Probably you think it's nothing but water. It's not nothing but water. It's something like sand with a whole lot of water in there. But it's not, you couldn't go swimming in the aquifer. So here is an example showing an aquifer. So up here we have a, a lake or somewhere that water falls on. And then we have the aquifer that's flowing here underground. And here is a gap. Somehow there's a crack going from the surface down to the aquifer. No water is coming out of that, so it says it's a dry artesian spring. Well, actually, it says artesian well. The difference in artesian spring and artesian well, an artesian well is you dug a hole and you hit the aquifer and the aquifer had such high water pressure that it just came out on its own. An artesian spring is you just happen to walk by and see, hey, look, there's water coming out of the ground. You didn't drill a well. Drill a well. So both artesian means the water's coming out on its own. Well means you dug it. Spring means it was just naturally a place where it came out. But this one, the first one, it's not flowing. Why is it not flowing? Why is no water coming out of the one that I've circled here? No, there's no blockage. The, the dashed lines here, the dashed lines are showing where the water table is. They're showing the top point where we have saturated soil. So that's just a dash from the dashed line there. Good. So why is the water not flowing out? There's water flowing out of the other ones. Not because of that. It might be affected by it, but it's not because. The direct reason is the surface up here, let me change colors. The surface up here is above the water table. The water table is the highest point where it's saturated. The water's not going to flow naturally up from the water table. So you could still get water out of there, but you'd have to have a pump because right, the water table is below the surface. But as you go further down in this picture, the water table comes above the surface here. Since the water table is above, the water comes up to that water table. It's above the surface of the ground, so comes a springing forth. 
Um, hot springs, if there's water coming out, it would be artesian in, in some sense, but oftentimes there you're talking about places where you have magma nearby that's heating up the, the water and then that hot water is floating up in the cold water to actually, to get a geyser, you have to have a bottleneck where it builds up pressure on the bottleneck until you have enough pressure to overcome the weight of the water above and, and shoots up. Um, so it's a little different if you have a geyser, but if it's just a hot spring, yes, it would be artesian. Why do we have no water down here? Yeah, it's because it's low permeability rock. Water should naturally flow downward, right? And so the water should just keep going down. But if you have low permeability, it can't go down anymore. Um, sand is high permeability. Water can easily go through sand. Sand is really good for aquifers because the water can go through it. So it can store it. It can transport it. But something like clay, it can't go through um, here is a perched water table. That's water on top of something that water can't go through. So it's perched, it's up there higher. Then you have a gap feet below that to the regular water table. Now, if I'm looking at these pictures, if I'm looking to drill a well, what would be some good things to use for drilling wells? Good ideas. Now, remember, the goal of the well is to not have to drill the longest well. The shorter the well, the better. Where would you want to drill it? Okay. So if you come nearer to the stream, if you're here, you don't have to drill that far. You don't want to be right at the stream because actually as the water goes through the soil, it's a natural filter. It filters out things that you wouldn't want to drink. So you want to have a little distance away from that stream. We do it the other way. In the Philippines, I went with some students on a, a Sulat's trip. And one of their things they do when they come to a Manobo village is they dig themselves a latrine. You know, instead of defecating anywhere, they say, okay, here's a place where we're going to have the feces. And they want to make sure that feces is at least 50 feet away from the stream because they want to make sure that you have the ground filtering anything that's coming from your waste before it gets into the stream because people actually drink the water out of the stream. And sadly, when I went with these students, the two Sioux lads had put their latrine too close and they said, you've got to move it. That's just, you know, it's not sanitary practice. So you'd want to be reasonably close to the stream because that's closer to the water table. Probably if you know that you have the perch water table there, you could drill into that perch water table. What's the potential downside of drilling into the perch water table? Yeah, it's not being replenished really well, probably. So it can dry up. Whereas if you go to that lower one, the main water table, you have a lot more volume. You're going to be less likely to have your well dry up. So sometimes people will drill. They'll hit water. They'll keep drilling and get to a dry spot, keep drilling some more and hit water again. And, you know, the lower one is probably the more reliable water source. Um, just some... Some terminology, the hydraulic head. The hydraulic head is really simply telling you what the elevation is of the water table. It has a reference point, usually sea level. So in this picture, we have the hydraulic head <coughs> indicated two points. On your left, at point A, the hydraulic head is 440 meters above sea level. On the right, it's what, 415 meters above sea level. And Given that these are separated by a horizontal distance of 1,000 meters, we can also talk about the gradient here, the hydraulic gradient is equal to the difference in hydraulic head divided by the horizontal separation. So in this case, that would be 
25 meters is the difference in the hydraulic head divided by a thousand meters. So the gradient would be 25 divided by a thousand or 0 0.025. Darcy's law was the guy's name is Henri Darcy, French dude, something from the 1800s. He said the, the rate at which water flows through the ground is equal to the hydraulic conductivity, that is the permeability, multiplied by the cross-sectional area. Think about a pipe. Cross-sectional area is the area of the pipe. So pi r squared if it was a circular pipe. So if you have a bigger pipe, you have a bigger cross-sectional area, you can have water go through easier times the hydraulic gradient, that's the pressure difference or the hydraulic head difference as you go from point A to point B. And so if you're trying to calculate how quickly water flows along this path, that's Darcy's law to help you calculate. Now, what do you need to know? You simply need to know that it's the rate at which water flows is proportional to each one of these excellent circled entities proportional to the hydraulic head or the pressure difference from one place to another, the hydraulic conductivity or permeability of the soil, and the <clears throat> cross-sectional area, how big the pipe is, so to speak. I just watched a great video about sinkholes. None of us wants to be involved with a sinkhole. You might have seen, what was it, in Kentucky that had a sinkhole and, like, these really valuable Corvettes fell in. It was... It, they were on display, <laughs> the, the display floor sunk into a sinkhole. Sinkholes don't just happen. Those are caused by water eroding material. So if you have an underground stream, the underground stream can do things like dissolve limestone, dissolve calcium carbonate. If it dissolves calcium carbonate, then you lost some of the rock. Or it can wash away material. You have to have both to make a, a sinkhole. And so this sinkhole here, which anybody recognize this locale? I'm asking because there are people who live reasonably close to this. Madeira, where, what? I think my dad was born in Madeira. Um, so that was in Madeira where they had just the middle of a road, a sinkhole. You can, you can watch the sinkhole developing on YouTube. They have video of it starting with a nice looking road going <laughs> and falling away. It occurred because underneath the ground had washed out. Because it's under a roadway, you couldn't see that the ground had washed out until the roadway collapsed. And, of course, you would not want to drive into that. And contrary to what some people have tried to do, if you go fast enough, you're not going to make it, okay? You've hit potholes in your car before, right? A pothole that's this big makes a huge jolt on your car. <coughs> the sinkhole is like a pothole that's bigger than your car. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, it doesn't matter how fast you're going, you're going to fall in. And yes, there are people who've tried. I'm going to go really fast. It'll be great. I'll just go right over it. No, no. If, go ahead. Um, I don't know how much washed away here. There are some that are enormous. Um, this one doesn't look like it's that big. It looks like it maybe is you know a ten foot deep um, sinkhole. And yeah, some of them are you know, buildings are falling in. It's pretty incredible to watch. What do they do to fix it? That's a good question. Well, the first thing you're going to have to do is to make sure that it doesn't erode anymore, right? So that means you'll probably want to try to divert the water somehow, put in something that won't wash away, something that's not limestone, and make sure you fill it in. So if it was me, I would fill it with boulders and sand, Water could go through the sand, but the boulders are not going to move, hopefully. And I'm not a civil engineer, so that's probably not the right answer, but that's what I would do. 
That's why we have civil engineers, people who are trained in how to deal with that. This is San Joaquin Valley. The, this is a slightly better resolution picture than the one in the book. This picture is really famous. You find it with all kinds of different resolutions. It had a subsidence of nine meters that occurred between 1925 and 1977. What is subsidence? Subsidence is the ground level sinking. Now, to me, this is a scary thing. The ground level dropped by nine meters, about 30 feet in around 50 years. How does that happen? Well, the San Joaquin Valley is part of California's fertile valley. They have huge amounts of farming. And so the farmers are pumping water out to water the crops. But they're pumping that water out of an aquifer and as the water leaves, then the material compacts and the ground level goes down. And so that's really scary that we could do something like that. Getting water back in, yeah, that's not, not a very proven method. There's actually a new process that people are trying in California where during the winter time, when you have lots of water, like this year, it's been enormous amounts of water. They're really overwatering their crops hoping to get that water to be absorbed into the soil so that in the summertime when things are dry, they have that water in the soil that then will keep their plants growing. So they're trying to, to do some of this to try to replenish the water table so that they can use that in the summers. So when clays leak water from the sand, then they get compressed and yeah, you're out of luck. Um, this here is just talking about the dissolving of limestone that I mentioned before, so I'll go past that. Here's an example of how like underwater caverns are formed. If you have limestone and water flows through, the water will dissolve just a little bit of limestone. Don't have to do a lot. Over time, you dissolve a large amount, and then you get a nice big cavern, which is just a big cave. So it's fun to go to caverns like Ruby Falls in um, what, what city is that in? Chattanooga? I've been to Ruby Falls. I should know. It's in Chattanooga. It's in Chattanooga. Okay. You, you go down there and it's just this huge chamber that is now empty because groundwater dissolved away the limestone. It also has stalagmites and stalactites, which are places where water dripped at the top. And as it dripped at the top, it deposits some of that limestone, leaving a spike that's pointing down. As it hit the ground, it deposits some limestone, making a spike that sticks up. So that's how stalactites and stalagmites are formed, is from water that contains calcium carbonate dripping. And contrary to what you may read some places, they form very quickly. There's reasonable sized stalagmites and stalactites under the Lincoln Memorial which you know, we know very well when that was put in. Um, yeah, I didn't even talk about this. I, I thought I'd delete that slide because I didn't talk about the karst regions at all. Okay, surface water. Surface water is streams, rivers, lakes, and of course the ever-present reservoir. Well, in California, the ever-present reservoirs. Um, these are places where we have water on the surface of the earth. Water on the surface of the earth, believe it or not, is something like 2% of the fresh water. So we saw previously only less than 3% of all of the water on Earth is fresh water. And of that 3%, only about 2% is on the surface of the water or of the Earth. All the rest is underground in those aquifers. So surface water is a small portion of the, the fresh water. And yet we think of these lakes and think, wow, that's an enormous amount of water. Well, not compared to the water that's in the soil. So infiltration is how water goes from being on the surface to being in the soil. And you can see here, there's a lot of things that have to do with it. Intensity and duration of precipitation. If it rains for a short time, the water is just going to flow off of the ground. But if it rains for a long time, you should have a lot that sinks in until you get saturated and then it flows off again. 
the soil type, if it's sand, it's going to absorb a lot of water. If it's clay, it will absorb very slowly. Um, the slope, obviously, if you have something like this, you're going to have a lot more runoff, a lot less that goes into the soil. Whereas if it's like this, you'll have a lot more standing, floating, or sinking down into the soil. And then finally, vegetation. So running water shapes the earth in two ways. Number one, it erodes and removes material. But number two, it deposits material. So running water will both remove and deposit material. And if you think about it very carefully, you realize it has to do equal amounts of both. Right? You can't deposit more than you eroded or else you run out of material. And you can't go the other way either. So here is, this figure is going to show up twice as well. I, when I was preparing, I was like, why is this twice? And yeah, because it's talking about different things. When you have a stream flowing, you have water flowing. And where water is flowing faster, you're going to have more material traveling with the water. Where it's going slower, you're going to have material falling out of the water. So if we look at the stream, the speed of the water depends on where you are. So if you are going around a corner, so you're going around this portion right here, because the water, of course, has inertia, the water tends to spend a lot more time on that side, a lot less on this side. So it's going faster over here and slower there. Yes. And in fact, you can see in this picture, it shows you that you have here on the inside where it's going slower, a deposition of a, it says a point bar. That's where material has been dropped out of the water, building up a, a beach, if you will. And on the other side, see how you have that surface that looks like it's had material dug out. That's because you have erosion on the side where the water's flowing fast. So it's eroding on the fast sides and depositing on the slow sides. Now, given that, that it's eroding on the fast sides and depositing on the slow sides, what should happen to the shape of this river over time? Yeah, it's going to get more windy. And so if we have something like this, we call them meanders because they, they move around and become more windy. So we'll see some pictures of meanders coming up. But first, we have to, have to talk about drainage basins. How many people have been to the Continental Divide? Really? One. First time I was at the Continental Divide, I was like, I wonder what this means. What's it dividing? The Continental Divide is dividing where water flows. So we have a drainage basin on this side that flows into the Atlantic. And on this side that flows into the Pacific. And so this continental divide is dividing where water flows. So if it's on the left side of that continental divide, it flows to the Pacific Ocean. It's on the right side, it flows to the Atlantic Ocean. And of course, I put Atlantic here. This is clearly, we don't call this the Atlantic. Yeah. Yes, we call this the Gulf of Mexico. But it's still Atlantic as far as, you know, ocean is concerned. So that's what the continental divide means. It's a drainage basin. Um, there is a technical difference between a drainage basin and a drainage network. Um, the, a network is a group of, of lake or rivers, and a drainage basin is the entire region that's draining off. So that's the technical difference. I am not going to ask you, please don't put on your potential test question, about the difference between a drainage basin and a drainage network. Just know what a drainage basin is. I'm sorry that you did that. <laughs> okay, um, we've already talked about this. This is what I mentioned. Candace asked about this. The, the faster the water flows, the more stuff it carries, the bigger stuff it can carry. If you have a turbulent flow, turbulent flow is when the water is traveling so fast that the friction between the, the edge of the stream and the water is bigger than what water can withstand and the water starts tumbling and making little cavities. When you have turbulent flow, you're gonna carry a lot more material. Laminar flow means it's flowing in layers and the laminar flow will hold less. So you can see here the turbulent flow 
it carries boulders and rocks. The laminar flow carries smaller material. Um, I've already said that. Three things that can cause weathering. We can have chemical weathering. That's what's going on when we have limestone that is being dissolved into water. That's chemical weathering. Or we can have hydraulic action. That's water eroding rock. It's not dissolving it, it's just eroding it. Or we can have abrasion, which is something that's rubbing. And so when you are walking on a trail, that's abrasion to cause the weathering. These holes here. Now, when I was a kid, we'd go out there to fish camp and we have things like that in the rock. And I said, oh, yes, those are where the Indians, you know, crush their acorns. Probably not. Probably simply the result of having sand and rocks swirling around in a little indentation, carving out a bigger and bigger and bigger indentation. Yeah, we were all naive at one point in our lives. Probably still are. Speaking for myself. Um, I want to get on to this. Here is a stream cut by, or a valley cut by a stream. If you have a valley cut by a stream, it tends to have a V shape to the valley. Does anybody know where this is from? Okay, that's what I thought. You said Yellowstone, right? That's what I thought too. I thought that that was um, the, I don't even remember the name of it, but that waterfall in Yellowstone Park. Go ahead, speak louder. I don't know, that, that's what I thought too. Um, but it forms a a V-shaped valley because the water just has eroded down where it runs. This happens if you have rough land, an alpine stream. We've already talked about this one. If you have flat land, we have the meanders. Here's how a meander develops. You start with a stream that's going in a generally downward sloping but not very steep region. And then you have the action that we've talked about where it erodes on the outside, deposits on the inside. And so any little wiggle gets accentuated. So you have bigger and bigger wiggles and the streams will actually move back and forth. So you have this region here, the stream has moved back and forth in that, flattening it out, making a meander valley. These things here are really cool. They're called oxbow lakes. <laughs> What do you think that thing is? It's an oxbow. Yes, yeah, good. What, what made it? <laughs> Don't know? Um, some animal. The stream used to go like this, and then you had a heavy flow of water. The heavy flow of water punched through here. Because it was coming so fast, it went up over the bank, eroded and made a new pathway but when it made that new pathway then you separated off this portion it's no longer part of the stream and it's left as an oxbow so they call them oxbow lakes you guys have been to omaha i'm sure been to the omaha airport and you know omaha airport is right next to was it carter lake Carter Lake is an oxbow lake, and it's a unique situation. The boundary between Iowa and Nebraska is the Missouri River. And the Missouri River has something <coughs> akin to this there where the airport is. And so the boundary between the states goes like this. And so you have Iowa... Iowa is on this side of the present Missouri River. And so you have the town of Carter Lake that's Iowa that's on the west side of the Missouri River. And it has Carter Lake on the outside and the Missouri River on the other side. And so that's why you have a little piece of Iowa inside Nebraska. Well, that's why that's there. 